Hello, Hello. attendees in listen-only mode. Hello. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us today for the Exploring Beaker webcast. This is the pre-show banter. The actual presentation will start at 2 p.m. That's Eastern time. That gives you half an hour to practice your beaker voice for every single thing yes. you hear. Almost like a drinking <laughs> game. <laughs> hey, John's got the movements uh, right down. So. That's yeah. right. <laughs> now we just need fire behind me. <laughs> 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 and set your hair on fire. We're all set. You know, That's every whatever time I try to do the beaker impression, I end up doing the Swedish chef. Okay, so I've got it. I've got it. All right. So um, Chris, Bill, yes. and I are going to give a serious security presentation, but instead <laughs> of slides, okay, instead of slides, uh, Shelby, if you could share your screen when you get a chance. I know you're doing stuff uh, with the yeah. uh, with the uh, Discord channel. Instead of slides, we're going to discuss security oh. in terms of the memes that you put up, right? <laughs> Oh, and, okay. <laughs> and when we have to do this, I'll start and then I'm going to pass the ball up in my situation to Chris and then he'll take it and he'll send it to Bill. And we'll see what we can do here. As soon as Shelby shares her screen, we'll, we'll start the, uh, we'll, we'll start the gift security roulette pre-show. No, no, no. It's, it's the Drew Carey's whose meme is this anyway? Whose meme is <laughs> it? I like that even better. So I need a meme to start. I need a meme to start. So we'll go through it. All right. So, okay. They've got to be PG, all right? But I, but I have to say, I have to say, whenever we're looking at vendors and all the things that are going on right now, everyone is sick and tired of all the crap that vendors are talking about. And one of the things I'd like to bring to everyone's attention is the recent evals of the different vendors and how well their vendors actually detected certain techniques that were launched by Cobalt Strike. And they missed a lot, like 20, 30 different techniques per vendor were missed on average. So, yeah, playtime's over. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Chris, pick a meme and go. Oh, my God. <laughs> so this is a representation of what the engineering team will be doing when we get version four out. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Not in six months. <laughs> Not in six months. <laughs> it will feel like that, though feels like that this whole year feels like 20 <laughs> so all right we're going to pass it over to bill let's see we've got beaker and we've already is, seen that one this is a wonderful example of what happens when when you get a person who has to review log files uh, your head just starts spinning you just can't keep even straight you just got so much input that there's no way to focus on what's actually happening on your network so or that, if you yeah. think the government well, is getting too obtrusive with all this, all the monitoring that's going on, here's an example of the toilet can. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> throw in a key. Yeah, oh, we got throw in a key. Sure. And actually, the one that's on the screen right now, that's the dance I did about 20 minutes ago when our air conditioner guy fixed our unit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's exactly how he looked at 124 degrees. So that's, uh, he's starting to come back to reality, too. Hey, and my arms actually do do that. They look bad. <laughs> well, that's because he's got the fan blowing up his butt. So I was going to say, Keith, Keith missed his calling. Uh, he, should have been, he should be standing outside of a used car dealership somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. 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 On that guy. <laughs> okay. I uh, like how Shelby's scrolling down slowly. It's like it's oh God, Keith again. Next? Oh hey, there <laughs> there's Keith. Ah! Hey. You have to be NIST 853 compliant. You have 10 <laughs> seconds to comply. <laughs> oh wow. Um, oh my God, no! Uh, I don't uh, do that. No. Uh, uh, God. We've decided to go with an MSSP. What could possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> wait, wait a minute, John. You own one of them. All right, Chris, do you want me to kick it off for you? Sounds like plan, dude. All right. I, I just want to say, everybody, thank you so much for joining this webcast for Active Countermeasures. This webcast is something that we have been intensely excited about at least since October, I think, maybe even earlier. And I want to explain why. Whenever you're looking at network threat hunting, network threat hunting, we believe, is absolutely key. And we believe that it's a missing piece that exists in many organizations today. In fact, if you go to the MITRE attack technique matrix, 
there are two whole columns that are generally ignored by every security vendor out there, the data exfiltration and the command and control columns. We saw that gap and we jumped in and we tried to take care of that gap with Rita as an open source tool and also AI Hunter. Now, with that, we had a number of customers and a number of people in our webcasts ask us, how can we actually correlate the network data that we're seeing with host level data? And there's a bunch of vendors out there today, endpoint vendors, that are developing endpoint agents and they're trying to hook into the operating system and they're trying to pull information about process execution and network connections. But here's the deal. Microsoft already did it. Mark Rosanovich wrote it. It's called Sysmon. It's free and you can implement it today. So what we wanted to do with the peanut butter and chocolate is we wanted to finally give AI Hunter and Rita its chocolate. We created a tool called Beaker. And this is the result of a tremendous amount of work from people like Roman at MetaCTF, Lisa Woody, Ethan Robish, uh, Melissa Bruno. There's been a number of people that have worked very hard on this. And this is simply an elk stack that ingests Event ID 1 and Event ID 3 from Sysmon. And Chris is going to go into a lot more detail about that here in just a little bit. But with that information, we can now equip anybody that's doing network threat hunting to be able to quickly and easily get to the bottom of exactly what process executed that network connection. In fact, we have a couple of cool curveballs that Chris is going to share with you with what happens when there is no process or it's been hidden. <laughs> so I want to say thank you very much. Unfortunately, I need to jump off this webcast, but I personally wanted to say thank you to absolutely everyone that is on this webcast. And I want to say thank you to the Active Countermeasures team. They've done amazing things, and we're really excited to finally share that with everybody that's on the webcast. So with that, Chris, Bill, Keith, Shelby, you all ready? We're ready. We be right, ready. Take it away. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, man. Awesome. Thank you, dude. All right. I'm and I am going to, yeah, I'm going to drop off camera two, just so it's a little bit easier to see what's going on here. Yeah, what John said, we are all like wicked excited. It's disruptive. I love being disruptive. And when I look at like what we did with Rita, what we did with A Hunter, I feel like it was really disruptive as to how you go through and do a threat hunt. Beaker, I think we're doing the same thing with that as well. First, quick thank you to the folks that support this. This is coming out of active countermeasures, but you know, we would not be who we are today without the support of Wild West Hack and Fast, Black Hills as well. It's cool to be part of this triad. So we wanted to kind of look at a couple of different problems and in, in what might be a good way to solve it. Starting with re reviewing network logs. I've been done a, ra a range of things over my years in my career, but I always kind of keep going back to the network. For me, it's always just, you know, it's the great equalizer. Any, every, anything and everything is there. You can't hide packets. You can just try to mix in. So I've always found it to be like a really good security sanity check. But it's not uncommon to kind of bump your head on feeling like I don't have enough data to make a really good decision right. Imagine you're going through your firewall log or, you know, you've got a network monitor collecting stats. You're seeing something that looks kind of suspicious. It doesn't necessarily look evil, but it looks suspicious. Maybe you're seeing a lot of traffic going to some, some IP address that you just don't expect to see. By obviously evil, I mean something like a port scan. You know, you can look at a port scan and say, yeah, okay, that is definitely not supposed to be happening. But that's the exception, not the rule. Most of the time, we have enough traffic to be able to look at it and say, okay, these two systems have been in contact with each other all day long for, for days now. That's kind of suspicious, but is it evil? You don't really know. So one of the things that would be kind of nice is if, as John said, we could tie this back to the host. Could we introduce data from the host itself to help solve this dilemma that we have when we're looking at this on the network side? And you have the same problem on the other end. Seams are big. Everybody loves collecting logs. Everybody loves using their 1990 pattern matching to go through and try and find the interesting stuff. Problem is, it, it doesn't really help without any type of context. Meaning that when I say using our 1990 antivirus technology, what I mean by that is pattern matching. When we go through our log entries, we're pattern matching. We're doing the same thing antivirus did back in the 90s before the, those vendors said, hey, this doesn't work anymore. We just haven't reached that point with our log review. We're still kind of looking for the stuff we knew the attackers were doing a month ago, a year ago, 10 years ago, hoping they'll do it again. And of course, it doesn't necessarily work that way. So again, you end up in that same spot where maybe it's evil, maybe it's not. I wish I had some more context to be able to kind of help me figure out what's going on. 
So what Beaker does is Beaker actually kind of ties these two problem areas together to create one solution. So what we do is we collect application information off of our endpoints, specifically applications that are creating network connections. When you start getting into collecting system level logs, it's real easy to go overboard. It's real easy to kind of get in that boat of feeling like, well, I'll just collect everything and then yeah, life will be fine because I'll have all the data. Well, of course, two problems you run into very quickly there. One is storage because now you're collecting everything off of all your systems. So, oh my God, that's just going to fill things up and cost me more money. But the other thing that we tend not to kind of think about is the more data you collect, the slower your searches are, the slower your indexing is. So by collecting more data, anything, any tools you're using to parse that data to try and actually find the interesting stuff, start running slower and slower. And it's real easy to end up in a situation where every day you're collecting so much data, it takes you more than 24 hours to go through and process that data. Well, that's not helpful to me, right? Because now we're going to very quickly start running behind. Beaker tries to solve that by saying, okay, the only data we're going to look at from the local system is applications that are talking on the network. That's it. Local running process, ignore all of that stuff. You can try and go after everything, but a lot of times by trying to go after everything, we end up with nothing. If we at least pick a target, only use the minimal amount of information needed to be able to figure out what systems actually need additional care, and then we can turn up logging on that system if needed, this all runs a whole lot smoother. So let me walk you through an example. So we're looking at a Hunter, and I'm picking on a Hunter here simply because, hey, look at this little Beaker icon here. We've already integrated into our commercial tool. But Beaker is designed to kind of be a reference tool on its own, and I'll get into more of that later. You can use it with anything. So like I said, you're reviewing firewall logs. You're going through your network-based intrusion detection alerts, and you, know, you want an additional reference. It's designed to work for that. But we've just gone ahead and integrated it directly in AA Hunter. So for the folks that have sat on our webcast before, one of the things I always talk about with this bottom graph is this is a 24-hour plot of traffic taking place. And if I can draw a flat line across the top, hey, that tells me I got a beacon. That tells me I've got a system that's beaconing across the network. Well, if you look at that graph on the bottom, it's not exactly flat, right? And in fact, one of the things we usually see is a very strict time interval taking place here. You know, the connection's always going off at exactly one second intervals or 10 second intervals one-minute intervals, whatever the case may be, this is kind of like all over the place. There's a couple of peaks at like 10 seconds, but then if I get out to like 18 seconds up to about 45, it seems to be bouncing around in that time range a little bit there. So there's definitely some funkiness going on here. It definitely looks suspicious, but based on what I have here, it's kind of hard for me to say, is it evil? Yes or no. Zero, I know I'm 100% certain it's safe. 100, I'm 100% certain it's evil. I'm maybe, you know, 65, 70, somewhere in that range there. I'm leaning towards evil, but I don't have enough to really prove it. It's going into DigitalOcean. Well, that's public space. That doesn't tell me anything. It's a TCP80 connection that has HTTP headers in it. Yeah, I see that stuff all the time. So what is this? What's going on? Well, if I click on my Beaker icon, that will jump me into Beaker, basically the Kibana interface within an Elk stack that goes through and says, okay, so that IP address you were just analyzing when it was talking to that destination IP and this specific time frame. So this all matches this. In other words, my time frame, my source IP, my destination IP, by clicking the beaker icon, I jump into that Kibana interface and it just matches those values to show me what application created that connection. This is pretty cool. Because now I was 70% certain it's evil, but I'm not really sure. I was kind of on the fence as to what might be going on. By jumping into Beaker, I get to see, oh, that was Notepad connecting to that IP address at TCP80. Wait a minute. Notepad does not do network connection. So if I was reviewing running processes and saw Notepad running, I probably wouldn't think twice about that. In other words, if I was trying to just do this analysis on my, uh, my SIM, and I see Notepad, not a big deal. On the network side, we already talked about that. 70% certain it's evil, but not really sure. So by, having, uh, by going through only one of those two data sources, I'd probably end up missing this. But by tying them together, oh, this stands out like a sore thumb, right? 
notepad connecting to an external IP address. I should not be seeing that take place. So this is the power of Beaker, the ability to go in and look at your network, look for those suspicious patterns. When you see something that makes you a little uncertain, be able to quickly go back into your system logs and reference what application actually was going through and creating that connection. This is huge because this one data point immediately brings me from, hey, 70% thinking it's evil to, oh, I'm at 100% right off the bat, right? No pad should not be doing network connections. Something else is going on. So what is Beaker? Beaker stands for Beaconing Kibana Executable Report. We've designed it specifically to kind of help catch beacons, but quite honestly, you can use it for data exfiltration. There's a bunch of other use cases you can kind of pull in well. This is an open source project, meaning that, yeah, you can go to that link in the bottom right here, download it, and start using it today if you want to. We talked about maybe making this a commercial tool, and we decided no, because this is one of those things where it's just, it, it's too powerful to wrap money around it. By that, I mean, John and I did not want to limit who can leverage this tool to only to be the folks that can actually afford it. So it's an open source project. Anybody can go in and download it and start using it. Anybody can start writing policies around it. It's all up to you. And what Beaker is, is it's a combination of tools. It's Sysmon, which John mentioned earlier. So Sysmon is a Microsoft tool. It's available for free. I'll talk a little bit more about what you can collect with that in just a little bit. We're using WinLogB to take the information generated by Sysmon and dump that into our Elk stack. And our ELK stack is just going through, sort and organizing and indexing all that data and giving us a Kibana interface to be able to go in and actually interact with that data. So Sysmon, like I said, is free and it's available directly from Microsoft. Link on the bottom, you can go download it today. If you have not started playing with Sysmon, most people have, but if you, have, if you are not part of the Sysmon camp yet, oh my God, you want to be. Because it is very granular in its ability to let you go in and kind of monitor systems. You can go in and you can look at everything. You can collect every little thing, every little process, every little file read. You can watch everything if you want to, or you can get very specific about only wanting to watch certain things. And that's one of the things we did with Beaker. With Beaker, we went and we said out of the, what is there, 25, 30 different event ID types, we only want to look at event ID threes. Three, event ID three is this application just opened a network socket to a remote system. That's the only thing we wanted to go in and look at. And when you look at what data does Sysmon collect as part of those event ID three connections, it's pretty awesome. So if you look at what I see here, I get to see the binary that created this connection. What directory structure did it run out of? Now, I don't have the hash of the binary. But there are ways to kind of enable other event IDs in order to be able to pull that in as well if I want to. That's kind of cool because that now opens up my capability to be able to say, hey, let me go off to a third-party resource, check that hash, and see if that's uh, no malicious binary if I want to go through and start doing checks that way. We did not build that into Beaker out of the gate just because that will add an awful lot of overhead to the system. And what we really wanted to do is kind of hit that biggest bang for the buck with the minimal amount of disruption within the environment that's trying to adopt it, that will get added in. You know, that and uh, similar features to that will get added in as options later that you can choose to implement or not. But I can go through and retrieve MD5 and SHA-1 hashes off of the binaries if I choose to go through that. It's also showing me, well, who is it connecting to? What IP address, what port, what transport? So basically, all that network information I need to be able to reference this against any of my network traffic. So again, if I'm looking at my firewall log and I'm seeing outbound connections from an internal system that look a little suspicious to me, that I see source IP, I see destination IP, I see what port is it going to, I know what time frame I'm doing the analysis over. That's everything I need to then be able to go jump into Beaker and say, show me what application was actually going in and making those connections. Well, wait a minute, hasn't this been done before? Yeah, there is. There's actually at least like two or three that I can think of off the top of my head projects that are designed to take Sysmon data, dump it into an Elk stack and make it searchable. The difference is that each one of those other projects are trying to be a standalone SIM solution. In other words, they're trying to kind of replace what you might buy Splunkfar or something like that. And they're trying to be all-encompassing, meaning, oh, don't worry about looking at the network. You can do all of your review within the logs itself. Well, gee, that sounds good. 
The problem is I'm collecting data off of an endpoint. If an attacker compromises that endpoint, the integrity of the data now being collected from that endpoint now becomes highly questionable. It's like asking me if I'm crazy. Well, of course, I'm going to say no, but that doesn't mean I'm not crazy, right? That's just my reference point. And if the system's been compromised, its reference point is now questionable. So what we wanted to do was create something that goes in and strictly focuses on those applications going out and doing those network connections so that you have a nice, easy correlation that can take place with all of your network entry logs. So we're trying to bridge that gap between standalone SIM, collecting all the data, doing the reviews there versus like the network stuff, firewall logs, NIDs, doing your reviews there. Yeah, you can go in and you can collect that information up into your SIM as well. In other words, I could take my firewall logs and dump it into my SIM and go in and do my review that way. The, the, the problem is you're kind of limited in the tools you go with. Let me give you an example of that. So I had a little comment I added here, and I didn't really reference it as I went through. It was talking about K-means night. What do I mean by that? When you look at beacon detection, you know, so this could be some third-party commercial tool that is a competitor to AA Hunter. This could be something like a module you add to Splunk to go through and try and do beacon detection. One of the things you'll notice consistently is they're all based on K-means clustering. If you're not familiar with K-means clustering, hey, do a look up on it. There's a wiki out there that explains it very well. In layman's terms, what K-means is, it's math to go through and look at a lot of data and look for patterns, look for consistencies that take place. So in other words, imagine I have a million connections leaving my internal network going out to the internet and one of my internal systems is compromised and it's beaconing home once per minute. K-means is designed to identify that. So K-means will look at those 1 million data points, but notice that once per minute pattern of that internal system contacting a specific IP address out on the internet, and it'll flag that as something you need to pay attention to. That's a beacon. That's what K-means is designed to detect. The problem you run into is jitter. Jitter is really popular with attackers today for their C2 channel. So what Jitter is, is Jitter is just going in and introducing some variable. And if you look at this timing dispersion, that's what this attacker has done here. My timing interval varies anywhere from two seconds all the way up to, I'm going to call that about 45 seconds. And it seems to be clustering around, you know, the 25 to 45 second range. But we've also got a couple of good sized peaks here down around the 10 second range. The timing on this is just all over the place. K-means would look at this and say, yeah, no, nah, I don't need to worry about that because it's not a repetitive pattern. Again, one of the problems you can run into trying to find this within your seam is that the modules that are designed to look for these types of patterns are based on K-means and K-means just doesn't cut it any. K-means was fine like 10 years ago, but once Jitter came out, K-means goes out the window. You'll find the simplistic stuff and it's great from a vendor standpoint because they can say, oh, yeah, hey, go in and set up a basic beacon and you'll detect it and you can test it and you will. Try testing it once you've in introduced Jitter. You'll fly right under the radar on most third-party tools, whether it, they're looking at the network or whether they're looking at this based within the system logs themselves. So, yeah, this has been done, but we're trying to do it a little bit different. And we're trying to fill a hole that we feel like still exists within the market today. You've got two ways you can go about using Beaker. One is you can just log into that HTTP interface or HTTPS interface, use the UI, go in, point and click your way through, and, and it's very easy to use that way. We've specifically tuned it to go in and look for things like be a reference tool for your network traffic, but there are a couple of different reports in there you can kind of take a run through if you want to that kind of match typically what you'd get out of a SIM anyway. Things like what are the what are the bottom 10 applications being run on your network? In other words, if everybody's running Google Chrome, who cares? If everybody's running Microsoft Word, who cares? But if there's one system running this specific application that nobody else is running, that might be something worth paying attention to. Yeah, there's reports like that that are already built in and we've got more coming. But the primary use case for this for us was the ability to be able to go in and quickly use this as a reference to hunt down what application just made that network connection. And it's all embedded in the URL itself, meaning that 
Within the URL, you can identify the time frame you're interested in. You can go in and you can identify the source and destination IP. And that's all the information you need to pass on the URL to be able to pull up that user interface and have it immediately drill down on what it is you're interested in. So again, you can load up the UI. You can then manually go in and say, I'm interested in this time range. I'm interested in this source IP, this destination IP. It will kind of walk you through that process and you can do it manually. But if you write a script or you create a link within the web app that you're currently using, like we did with AA Hunter, it now makes it really easy to just automatically pass all of those variables into Beaker. So Beaker just goes through and pulls up exactly what it is that you're interested in. And here's what the dashboard looks like. I've got the different parts of this kind of called out in the next couple of slides, but I'm going to kind of run through it here because it just gives you a little bit better context as you go through the whole thing. The source destination IP that we're interested in, that's just a filter criteria. If I wanted to go in and filter it a little bit more for whatever reason, I'm only interested in TCP 80 or whatever the case may be, I could go in and add additional filters if I want to on the fly. But typically, this IP talking to that IP, that's the stuff that we're most interested in. What's the time range that we wanted to work with? You can go in and you can define that as well. So if I'm reviewing logs from three days ago, I can go in and I can change this time range to, hey, Beaker, what were you seeing for applications running on that system three days ago? Here's the specific connection I'm trying to go in and hunt down. One of my favorites is this here. This is kind of like that bottom graph within AA Hunter. So if you have a, an application that's beaconing, it'll actually show that flatline beaconing behavior that we talked about within AA Hunter. If you're not running AA Hunter, if you're not using Rita, one of the ways you can go about trying to identify beacons on your network is to go in and look at applications and look for the specific pattern. There's no easy tool to extract that within Beaker yet, but that is coming. The ability to go in and kind of detect beacons, long connections, that type of thing within Beaker itself, that type of functionality is on its way. We also give you a breakdown of the protocols. Gee, that's kind of nice. For the most part, it's, I don't know, it's just a pretty graph. This is probably the least useful piece of information on the screen here, but hey, it fit in that spot, so why not? And then what we were looking at before the actual binary that's being executed. This tells me this is the application that's going in and making the connection. This can be super useful. So if I'm looking at system logs and I see HP Notify was creating TCP 443 connection, I may look at that and say, wait a minute, we don't run HP printers. Something's wrong. Or why is this HP tool doing connections to the network? Or hey, HP is always trying to get me to print through them anyway, because they want to try and turn that into a service they can charge money for. But oh, wait a minute, that IP address isn't within HP's IP address space. Something's wrong. In other words, this connection doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Down the bottom, and again, I get a slide that kind of zooms in on that a little bit later, is all the details. If you really want to get into the minutiae of what was going on with that connection, what process ID was it running under and stuff like that, yeah, you can go in and you can dig on that as well. But to me, the most important piece of information right here, what applications were actually run. I can go in, I can define search queries. The most popular, I think, is going to be able to go in and say, show me data that's associated with this source IP talking to this destination. That's the stuff I want to go in and pay attention to over some specified date range. But use your imagination. You can go in and you can use this for uh, other things as well. Imagine I went in and I said, huh, HP print notify. Yeah, no, something's wrong. This is bad. One of the search criteria I can go in and look for is, hey, did anybody else run HP notify? If so, if that's running on some other systems, Maybe that helps me figure out it's okay. Maybe that tells me, oh, wait a minute, I've got more than one system on my network. I really need to go in and kind of pay attention to this thing. The event summary, like I said, this to me is like cat's pajamas. And I, I love this ability here. I love the not just show you a raw count of how often it ran, but do it on a time analysis. Because again, when we're looking for C2, a majority of the time they're doing B majority of the time, it's create the connection, close it down, create the connection, close it down, create the connection, close it down. And this sticks out like a sore thumb once you start looking at it this way. So it's just a nice visual aid. I have, let's say I have a source IP that talked to a destination IP 4,000 times. If 
4,000 connections were created in a 10 minute period of time, and then nothing else happened for the next 24 hours, yeah, it's probably not a beacon. That was just a busy session. I might have had a lot of data getting pushed out over HTTP 1.0 or something like that. It's probably not a command and control channel for me to be concerned about. But if I see the exact same number of connections and they're evenly dispersed over a 24 hour period of time, oh, yeah, that's a beacon. That's something I need to pay attention to. And again, my graph is going to show me that. The application, this is really where, this is really the big payoff for us here. So the ability to go in and say, hey, I was going through my network-based intrusion detection system. It generated an alert on this internal system talking to that external system, and it said it saw something that is known to be some form of suspicious pattern. I don't know if that's something I need to worry about or not. Here, I can just jump right in and say, what application did that? Is it something that I need to be concerned? You get an awful lot of detail. So each one of these entries is going to go in and create two log entries, each one with different pieces of information about what was going on, but everything you could possibly want to know. Who owned it? Who ran that process? It'll go in and it'll tell you that. That can be kind of useful in these cases too. If I go in and I see, you know, PowerShell is running, it's creating a C2 connection back to EC2. Well, if PowerShell is being run by John Strand, Okay, John does a lot of red team stuff. It's probably just John screwing around. I'm not going to worry about that. But PowerShell is being run by Chris Chu. Well, wait a minute. Chris is our head of sales and partner alliances. She doesn't mess with PowerShell. That's something we need to go in and pay attention to. That's something where, hey, maybe somebody's dropped something on that system. So having that user context, knowing who owned that process when it ran, that can help you kind of run these things down as well. So let's look at another example. Here we've got, I've got an internal IP address talking to an external IP. Again, this looks like TCP 443 traffic. I'm seeing SSL headers here. I'm seeing a fairly tight time interval that took place. Along the bottom, I can see, hey, here's that beacon activity over a 24 hour period of time. We've got a little fall off here in the middle. Looks like something happened here. You know, something slowed down the connection rate or something like that for a little while. But this is kind of looking beaconing to me. Now, we've talked about before, beacon doesn't mean evil. Beacon is a common way that attackers will have their compromised systems call home. It's a common way of creating a command and control channel. And it's unusual for normal communications. But it's not completely uncommon. You know, network time protocol, it beacons all the time. It, it, that, that's just the way it operates. So just because we see a beacon doesn't mean we know it's bad. It just means, hey, it's communicating in a way that's not normally seen on the network, except in specific cases, and this doesn't seem to make that case. So again, I'm looking at this, and I'm kind of back to that 70% range. I'm back to saying, I'm leaning towards I think it's evil. I'm not certain enough of it being evil to be able to raise a red flag and say, whoa, wait a minute, we need to go in an instant handle. Well, we've got an, in, you know, this internal system's been compromised. This is absolutely a command and control channel. Don't know that for sure yet. But if I go and I jump into Beaker and say, okay, that internal IP talking to that, that external IP over the time frame that I was reviewing in my network-based tool, what application was creating that connection? Well, if I look down here, it's PowerShell. We talked about this. So if Jean-Luc Picard is one of our red teamers, hey, this is probably okay. We may want to mention it to him just to make sure it was actually them, but yeah, I'm not going to freak out on this one. If Jean-Luc Picard works in HR or finance or sales or some other group that never, ever, ever uses PowerShell, yeah, this is something I need to go in and pay attention to. We're definitely moving into incident handling mode. Now, let's say the only thing I have is just applications connecting to the network, and that's it. That's all I have to work with here. In other words, I haven't been collecting any other system-level log entries off of this endpoint. What should be my next step? Well, my next best step is to go in and look at what other network connections has this system been doing? Because if it's starting to reach out to all the local desktops, oh, that's something I need to pay attention to because somebody may have compromised this system. This is now their beachhead into my network and they may be trying to move laterally. So if they're moving laterally, if they're trying to move off to other systems, 
that is going to be represented in the data of showing the applications on that system that are reaching out across the network. So I can at least go in and very quickly assess, have they started to do lateral movement? Yes or no? I can extract that out of here. And getting that is easy. All I need to do is go up to the top here and say, don't show me destination IP address. My filter is source IP 192.168.99.51. And well, get rid of and and everything after that. I only care about all the data that's associated with this source IP. That'll now add to this list additional applications that have created network connections. I can now start going through that list of applications to say, okay, do any of these look suspicious? I may even want to go in and further say, hey, if it looks like they're running their stuff as Jean-Luc Picard, let me first do a pass to say, show me all the application connections that are being run as Jean-Luc Picard. That may, that'll help me kind of focus in on what's going on. I wouldn't recommend only doing that because they may have gotten full administrative access to that system. There may be other process IDs, or excuse me, there may be other user contexts that are being leveraged as well. If all I look at is just the source IP, those will all pop up for me, go through that list. Does any of it look like lateral movement? That's a great way to be able to go and run this down. Now, once I've done that, what have we figured out so far? We've found the C2 channel. We're seeing how they're communicating out to the network. We've identified lateral movement. We can go in and we can look to see what's going on. And oh, by the way, one of the other things we can do, get rid of the date range and maybe do a search on PowerShell. So now that I know PowerShell is the tool that they're using to call home, one of my first questions should be, when did they start doing that? Well, if I get rid of my date range, I can go back in my beaker data to see when was PowerShell first starting to show up doing network connections on that system. Now I've got a time range to identify when was that system actually compromised. So now when I want to go in and start looking for lateral movement, I can do a quick check from right now, but I'm probably want, going to want to go back all the way to when this C2 channel was first created, because the way this will work is the attacker will, let's say they do spear phishing against this user. They get them to click something they shouldn't. That'll give them a point of entry into the system. They establish their command and control channel, and then they come in over that command and control channel, and they're either going to go after the local system, start trying to move laterally, or they're going to do a bit of both. So until PowerShell EXE shows up, I don't have to worry about lateral movement. But whenever that first instance of it shows up, from that point until now, those are all the network connections that I want to take a look at. Now, all of this is data that's already in Beaker. Don't have to turn on any type of additional recording in order to figure that out. So I've tagged command and control. I've figured out the time frame for my incident. I've figured out if there's any lateral movement. What might I want to do next? Well, I might look at this and say, okay, this box is definitely owned. From this one box, I want to record everything, not just event ID threes. I want the hashes of any files that are getting loaded into memory. I want to see it all. And that'll allow me to go in and start doing a deeper dive on this. Now, whether you do that or not kind of depends on your incident process. Some environments like to go in and say, hey, we've been compromised. Let's collect as much data as we possibly can before we tick, tick the attackers out. We want to collect as much intel as possible. Some environments will look at this and say, whoa, get them out of my now. Do it now. <laughs> you know, I, I don't care about data collection. I care about getting them off my network. And which boat, boat you fall into kind of depends on the culture of the environment. It also is going to depend upon the severity of the incident. If someone has compromised an endpoint of a user that has limited access to the network, let's say it's an intern or something like that, I might not need to hurry or feel the need to hurry to get the attacker off my network right away. I want to make sure I have full scope and identification of everything that they've actually been able to touch. But if they've broken into the CEO system, or if there's evidence that they've already pivoted over to financial system, and this is their bridge to be able to get to that, yeah, I may need to kick them out as quickly as possible. So again, I can, at this point, say, this one system, start collecting more data. Whether that's a good idea or not kind of depends on your handling process. But again, at least here, it's a possibility. Now, by the way, now we're not collecting all that damn data all the time when we don't. So I wanted to walk you through one more example. 
So again, same thing we've been seeing all along. Source IP, going to a destination IP. This is TCP80 traffic. Pretty interesting timing here again, right? We're seeing a cluster of timing around 27 seconds. We're also seeing a cluster of timing around 10, 12 seconds. Now, you know, for me personally, oh yeah, that's, that's a beacon. That this is not only a beacon, this is an evil beacon. In other words, you know, we talked about NTP it has a method of communication that's beacon-like. There's other things that do it too. Industrial Internet of Things devices commonly fall into this. If I have like a temperature sensor that's monitoring a portion of my assembly line or, you know, whatever, wherever it needs to go in and monitor temperature, and it's reporting that back to a central controller, it's going to be doing that on a strict schedule, once a second, once every 10 seconds, however it's been configured. When you see beacons being used legitimately, they're always going to follow a strict time interval. Every second, every 10 seconds, 10 times a second, whatever that interval happens to be, when I look at the time delta analysis, I'm going to have one peak, and I might have a couple of small outliners just because, hey, it's a network, and sometimes you know the network isn't free, and that'll vary my timing just ever so slightly. Anytime you see something like this, oh, that's intentional. <laughs> that is somebody specifically trying to get past K-means clustering and making sure they didn't get caught. So for me personally, I look at this and this says evil, very evil. But for your average person, they may not pick up on that. They may look at this, hey, well, you know, it's not really a flat line, but it's close. So maybe I need to worry about this, maybe not. So again, for me personally, I would look at this and say, warning, Will Robinson, we need to worry about the source I pay. But imagine you don't assess it the same way. You look at this and you say, no, 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 Chris, I'm more in the boat you were in before, 70%. I'm 70% certain it's evil, which is not enough to kick in an instant handling mode, but I want to just go in and do some additional investigation. I can go up to my beaker icon, click on that, jump into beaker and see what beaker has to show me. Oh, wait, beaker's telling me nothing. I have no data in beaker right now. Okay, it's one, this tells me one of two possibilities are taking place. Possibility number one, this source IP does not have Sysmon running on it. It's a Linux box. It's an industrial Internet of Things device. It's a Windows system we haven't gotten around to yet. We're still running Windows NT 3.51, and Sysmon doesn't support that. Yeah, you laugh. They're out there. Come on. We all know they're still out there. But Sysmon is just not running on the system. Possibility number two, this could be somebody really savvy. This could be like nation state level where they know how to hide their processes from Sysmon. This is somebody that's skilled enough that Sysmon goes to look for them and, hey, these are not the droids you see, right? Which is it? How do I figure that out? With Beaker, it's dead simple. Here's what I do. Same thing we were talking about doing before when we wanted to deepen our analysis. Go up to the top here, get rid of and and everything after that and hit enter. Look at what applications were creating network connections off of that system. Because any network system is going to be talking on the network. In this case here, we only had two boxes on the network, 54, 55. So destination IP filled in, and it showed me some connections that were taking place to that system. But if this was a larger network, what you would see is the destination IP address field here would be blank. And I'd have a ton of applications listed down here that talked to various different IPs that took place. So if I see that, well, wait a minute. We said here we had two possibilities, right? Sysmon was never loaded or stealthy attacker that knows how to hide their processes. Which is it? Well, we've got Sysmon data. We just don't have the Sysmon data for the network connection we're seeing. This is a stealthy attacker. This is somebody who's smart and savvy enough to be able to go in and hide their processes from Sysmon. Now, if I'm doing my review, you know, my SIM, and that's it. In other words, if I'm trying to catch malicious activity by going through my SIM logs, there's no SIM logs here. There's nothing to review. There's nothing to say. I am going to miss this. But by spotting the suspicious network pattern first, then going back to my system logs from there, the fact that it's not there sticks out like a sore thumb. This makes it dead simple to go in and identify this. Folks spend thousands of dollars in SANS classes or going to college classes or whatever to figure out forensics. 
if, if a buddy comes to you and says, hey, how do I find a hidden process? How's that conversation going to go? Right? That's going to be a long conversation because there's a lot you need to know to figure out how do you tag a process that's hidden in memory? The skills you need, there's tools you need. There's all sorts of supporting stuff you need to know and how it works to be able to figure that out. Okay, let's back this up a little bit. I'm a junior analyst. I've gone through two years of college, going towards my security degree, and I now work on your network. And you want me to be able to pick up some of the slack on the threat hunting side. So I'm not green, but I'm pretty damn close to green. Can you make me an effective threat hunter that can catch hidden processes with this system on your network? Hells yeah, right? I can go in and I can say, hey, here's your run book. And your run book has a picture of this and says, two, p- two plus peaks, bad. This is you know, leaning towards evil, bad. Flat line down here, bad. So you can give me a run book with pictures, circles, and arrows that tells me what I need to go in and look for. And now I've got an easy reference to go through and follow. Can you do the same thing here? Hells yeah. If you go here and there's nothing, here are your two possibilities, one or the other. And here's how to figure out which possibility it is. Just delete that second IP address. Now, if nothing shows up, enter a ticket into IT to tell them that we need to have Sysmon running on this endpoint. Problem solved. If you see this, applications show up that are talking to other systems, but you didn't get to see which one created that network connection, call a senior analyst. Get them involved in this situation. Do you think you could do that with someone with two years of college? Absolutely. What have we just done? We've done a couple of things here. One is we've opened up the ability to go in and tie back things to an application, made that easier. But we've made that so much easier, we've reduced the skill set required. Now, one of our missions within Active Countermeasure is to make this stuff as simple as possible. I mentioned on webcast before that when you look at our tool and the simplicity behind it, a lot of where that came from was one of our earliest customers was a medium-sized city out in the Midwest that have two security people for the entire city. That's it. But they have a help desk of 25. And the challenge they gave us, make your tool simple enough that someone who is trained as a help desk person, and that's it, can actually be our first line of defense and threat hunting. And I feel like we've done a pretty good job with that with AA Hunter. We're going for the same thing with Beaker. So again, the whole idea here is you can take a junior analyst, you can put this in front of them, you can give them a run book with some circles, pictures, and that's it. And they're going to become damn effective at being able to run these things down when they happen on the environment and only need to tap the senior people on the shoulder when they're We were able to go through and kind of run all of this stuff down. And so easy a junior analyst could use it. I already kind of talked you through all this. So again, this is an open source project. This is not commercial. I gave you the link earlier. Shelby mentioned earlier, if you go to Discord, we've got the slides posted there. I believe in the uh, chat session, it's got a link that you can go to to get to Discord. And then from Discord, you can go grab a copy of the slides. Go grab a copy of Beaker and go in and start playing around with that. I, I think it does some pretty cool stuff. And Bill, I have not seen you appear even once, so I'm going to assume nobody has questions. I am either A, so good at what I do that I answer people's questions before they even have a chance to ask them, or B, people found this so damn boring they've checked out and they've gone someplace else. Which is it? <laughs> it's obviously the first, Chris. That's, such, that's just an easy question to answer. We've had a couple of people write in with questions along the lines of, hey, that's cool if you're using AI Hunter. Can you use this with other tools? Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's a web UI interface that I can go in. Tell you what, let me uh, let me get rid of the screen. Let me get rid of the webcam. Back to. Let's see, is my screen shared off or no? I can see a Google search page. Well. So yeah, all the examples I was running through was using a hunter to get there. And the reason for that is we've just linked it all in. You can see all my data is getting passed out on the URL. 
So I was using this as kind of a kind of to show you what are the possibilities that you can go through and do the do with this tool. But there's a user interface here. So I can go in and I could just say, hey, I'm not interested in this IP address. I'm interested in this IP address, which I'm not sure is even there. Oh, hey, look, yes, it is. So you can go in and you can just log into this tool, log into this user interface. And then once you get to this interface, just go in and put in whatever criteria it is that you're looking for. I, I didn't dwell here because this is very manual. When you think about I'm going in and I'm, I'm doing a threat hunt, and I've got a bunch of different connections I want to go in and do research on. If I have to do this manually, it's really going to slow me down. So the way I want to go about doing this is I want to have you know, some sort of script either built into my UI or, you know, hey, you could even do this on command line if you wanted to. I'm sure, I'm sure Stearns is thinking of like a half a dozen different ways you could do this with Python if he wanted to. <laughs> oh, yes. But you could set this up as just a command line switch. Let me run my script. Here are the variables I want to pass in and bang, have it load up this UI and end up directly where you want to be. You can use it in either fashion. Either one will work. It's just one is going to take a little bit less of your time than the other. Cool. What else you got, Bill? A couple of people asked about Linux and Mac OS client support. Yeah, not there yet. We're, we're looking at it. You know, We're looking for like the Sysmon equivalent on those sides, but I'll be honest, we're not there yet. Got it. Perfect. I think there are a couple more questions coming in, but I think we're, we're largely getting answered at this end. Okay, uh, I have a couple from the Discord channel. Perfect. First one is from Noopy. He's asking, can you go a little more into the aspect of installing Sysmon on every client in the network? <laughs> so I think he might be more leading to like, like our agent, how we tie it in. Yeah, exactly. With Beaker is a script that you can run as like a login script that'll pull everything into that endpoint once the person logs in to kind of automate the process for you. Now, with that said, that's not the way most people do it, especially at scale. There are inventory type tools to be able to go through that. There's other processes. Bottom line there is whatever method your environment uses today to push software out to endpoints, that's what you use. If you don't have anything at all, hey, we're a small environment, 20 hosts, and I just haven't gotten around to creating anything like that, great. You can use the script that we supply with, with Beaker in order to be able to go through and get that done. So that'll get the software onto the endpoint. Sysmon uses policies. The policy just basically tells Sysmon, this is what I want you to go in and pay attention to. So out of all the possible types of events that will take place on this system, these are the ones I want you to focus in on. So it'll install that, and it'll also install WinLogBeat, which is what we're using to move the logs from that endpoint onto the Beaker system, which is running the Elk stack. So that's what gets pushed out to the endpoint. Now, one of the other questions that always kind of comes up is, how process intensive is this? You know, my end user is going to notice it. And the answer to that is, hopefully not. The default policy we went with, only grabbing what applications are creating network connections, is actually a fairly minimal hit. So most most systems aren't going to, most users aren't even going to notice that. Now, if you start going crazy, there's other similar projects out there, but they're recording event ID ones, which is every executable DLL binary what at, what have you that what gets run on that system at all. Let's collect forensics level detail on that. If you turn that on for everything, yeah, you're going to kill performance on that system. Absolutely. But the default policy that we push out with Sysmon, network applications only, minimal hit is part of it. And what I'm doing here, by the way, is I'm just kind of showing you, here's all the different types of things I could go in and I could look for to be able to go in and kind of filter on to be able to kind of focus in on something that's taking place on the system. Any other questions? Chris, I'm, I'm not sure the answer to this one. You've got source IP up on the screen right now. I can't remember if you are able to say source network. Is Can you filter at that level and say, hey, show me an entire slash 24? I can do, I can do source domain, source address, I'm not source geo, <laughs> source IP. Okay. So it looks yeah, like I'm not IP seeing only. source network. So, you, but you could do source IP colon blah, 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 or source IP colon blah, blah, blah. You could have multiple IP addresses, I'm sure, on the filter. 
Let me try something funky here. Ah, go away. Go away. Close that. Thank you. What if I do this? Uh, it looks like it's still only returning that one system. Oh, but that may be the only data I have. It took the slash 24. It took it in CIDR format, but I don't know for certain if this is actually working on that. Got it. Hey, thank you, Chris. Of course. Any other questions? You know, we've had a couple of people on Discord asking about um, the best way or how to or if it can be integrated into Splunk. <laughs> <laughs> because the data is just not real unless I'm paying huge amounts of money to store it. Yeah. I know. Well, I was trying not to laugh, but you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you do this with Splunk? Yeah, you could. You could kind of mimic what we've done within Elk, within Splunk itself. Certainly Splunk has this capability to it, but it's not designed to kind of do this to Splunk right out of the Hey, don't get me wrong. Splunk's a good tool. I've used it for years. Hell, back when I created the logging class for SANS, what was that, 15, 20 years ago, whatever it was, Splunk was the tool I was using. But at that time, Splunk was pretty liberal with how much data you could store before you had to start signing over your firstborn mill child. It's not a cheap solution. So what I've noticed in a lot of environments is Splunk tends to be <laughs> that pain they deal with because they have to. In other words, we have this and, oh my God, it's costing us so much money. We can't buy other tools and we're you know, trying to figure something out. So we're using it because of that. This might be a good opportunity to start kind of shifting your data someplace else. In other words, the easiest path might be to just throw the data in Splunk and deal with it, but that's going to cost you money. So maybe what you do is put this data in an Elk stack that'll cost you some resources up front. It's not going to cost you that monthly fee. And if everything starts working, maybe you just start kind of migrating things off that way. I'm not saying, hey, everybody dumps Splunk, but we've got to kind of balance our budgets, right? Especially with everything that's been going on lately. And if we can save money, all the better. And if one of the ways to go about saving money is to not pay as much for storing our logs, this might be a good way to go through and solve that problem. Any other questions? Chris, Adam was kind enough to share back that your slash 24 approach was, in fact, correct, that it, it would have shown the records for the entire subnet if you'd had any other machines on that in that awesome. data set. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, dude. Of course. Thank you, Adam. I think we're getting down to uh, pretty close to finishing up. Yeah, we're down to like three minutes. So we're down to like post-show banter, and that's about it. <laughs> I do have a quick question for you, um, because actually I don't know the answer to this. Uh, and Go for it, dude. Do either. Asking, will, will the Splunk agent interfere with the wind log beats? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure of the answer on that either. Splunk agent uses WinLog beats. That's Even better. Yeah. Yep. And I should be able to go in and, and tell WinLog beat, hey, send some data here, send some data there. So I could send a Splunk into Beaker at the same time if I want. 